In this episode of the St. Philip Institute podcast, we're going to finish up our discussion on Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the Church, and we'll be focusing especially on this idea of the universal call to holiness, so you can see what it means for you, for everybody, to be holy. Please enjoy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, You called St. Philip the Evangelist to open his mouth and begin with Scripture, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we too are called to work for the salvation of souls. Instill in our hearts the zeal of St. Philip, that we may convert hearts and minds to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, welcome back to the St. Philip Institute podcast. My name is Luke Arredondo. I'm the Director of Faith Formation here at the St. Philip Institute. And we are, in this episode, going to be finishing up our series of episodes on Lumen Gentium, uh, one of the major four documents from the Second Vatican Council. So in this specific conversation, what I'm going to be focusing on is chapter 5 through 8 of Lumen Gentium, so beginning in paragraph 39 and going all the way through to the end of the document, um, which is going to be uh, paragraph, let's see, there's an appendix on the document, 69, so the last 30 paragraphs of the document. Um, We'll probably spend more time talking about the fifth chapter than anything else in that last part of the document, and that's because chapter 5 of Lumen Gentium is the universal call to holiness. So I feel like if there's only one thing that you know about Vatican II, uh, it's probably that the universal call to holiness was a big part of the council. And just a little bit of a comment on that idea before we even talk about exactly how the council fathers in the text lay out this this idea of the universal call to holiness, I think it's important to say uh, it's not as though, to, you know, in the history of Catholic theology, nobody had ever thought of the idea that the lay faithful and everyone in the Church should be holy. And then at the Second Vatican Council, we suddenly realized we've only been telling priests to be holy and nuns, and we forgot that everybody else is supposed to be holy. The universal call to holiness is really impl- is really clear in Scripture. Like you, and we are all called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. At the same time, though, it's important to acknowledge that at the Second Vatican Council, this call for the laity to be holy uh, really shines a lot more than maybe it had in the preconciliar uh, period. So in the, in the period, especially uh, from Vatican I to Vatican II. And I've made this comment in probably every episode on Lumen Gentium at least, uh, but I'll repeat it here just because it's it's so central to this idea of the universal call to holiness. Vatican I was an incomplete council. It was interrupted by the breakout of the Franco-Prussian War. And there was an intention to deal with all levels of the church, but we only really got through the the papacy, right? So there's a real heavy emphasis in the period following that council on the hierarchy and the way that the hierarchy is called to be holy. And there's always been a call for the the lady to be holy, but that phase of church history from, you know, the the end of the First Vatican Council up through the 50s and, and 60s into the Second Vatican Council it was a little bit harder maybe to see some of that call. Doesn't mean it wasn't there. There were certainly great exceptions to this. John Paul II, for instance, St. John Paul II grew up uh, being taught by a tailor uh, who who lived in his hometown. Uh, His name was Jan Tiranovsky, and he was a, a layman who knew deeply that he was called to holiness, and he helped to form St. John Paul II into the person that he is and that, that he became. Um, and he would not have done that had he not understood the implicit call to holiness that's there for everybody. So in the actual document, this fifth chapter, uh, it's it's really only a few paragraphs. I think it's 39 to 42. Um, so very small in terms of the number of words, but huge impact on the way that the church 
uh, sort of understood what evangelization was for and, and that everybody was called to holiness. This maybe got through better than anything else from the council, and we should be glad because of that. So in the first paragraph, chapter, uh, paragraph 39 of the text, the churches, uh, the, the, the council fathers, rather, are laying out this idea that the holiness of the church is central to its essence. No, the, in other words, the church is one holy Catholic, Catholic and apostolic, right? The church itself is holy, and we as members of the church are called to that holiness that the church has in and of itself— uh, the church is supposed to be a spotless bride, so there's this reference to Ephesians 5, where St. Paul is describing the church as being kept holy and blameless and spotless for uh, b- because it is the bride of Christ. So I want to read just this, this really brief excerpt from uh, paragraph 39, um, so you can get a sense of, at the beginning of laying out this argument, what does the council say? This holiness of the church is unceasingly manifested and must be manifested in the fruits of grace which the Spirit produces in the faithful. It is expressed in many ways in individuals who, in their walk of life, tend toward the perfection of charity, thus causing the edification of others. In a very special way, this holiness, the the perfect holiness of the church, appears in the practice of the councils customarily called evangelical. Evangelical councils mean uh, poverty, chastity, and holiness. Uh, uh, chast- poverty, chastity, and obedience, sorry. Poverty, chastity, and obedience are the evangelical councils. So this holiness that everyone is called to is manifest in a special way through those evangelical councils. And I'll read this one more sentence and then offer some, some comments and some context here. This practice of the councils, under the um, impulsion of the Holy Spirit, undertaken by many Christians, either privately or in a church-approved condition or state of life, gives and must give in the world an outstanding witness, an example of this same holiness. So what the church here is is trying to, to describe and explain is that as members of the church, we're called to perfect holiness because the church is holy. We participate in that by being members of the church, and we receive grace to help us do that. There is a link here, as in a lot of other uh, parts of the of the, the council documents that we've explained here um, on the podcast and others that, that we won't get to, between the holiness of, of an individual and evangelization or witness. So, There's an emphasis here on being holy, because that's what we're called to be, and on the fact that when we cooperate with Christ, when we live a true life of charity, we offer edification to others. And in a special way, when someone takes on the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, they give the world an outstanding witness and example of the holiness that we are all called to, okay? Um, and Christ, in fact, calls his disciples not just to holiness, but to perfection. That same goal is made to us. The council, though, affirms we're not alone in trying to live out this quest. We're, so it's not just up to us as individuals by our own might to achieve holiness. Rather, God sends us the Holy Spirit in our baptism and in confirmation, uh, so that with the gifts that he's given us, we can then hold on and complete in our lives the holiness that we've received. So it's both something that we receive and something that we have to sort of participate in and cooperate in. Um, in this this chapter on the universal call to holiness, there's um, interesting discussion about a lot of individual groups. So there are, it, it, and it's something worth reading for yourself, but we don't have to read, time to read the whole thing. There are specific tasks that the council calls bishops, priests, deacons, parents, widowed people, single people, and even those who work in manual labor and those who are in poverty, right? Sort of specific kind of special little tasks of holiness that are given to these different groups. Uh, and then at, after going through each of these individual groups, it kind of gives a summary statement of what is true for everybody. 
So this is the instruction that is given to all of those groups, to everybody. This is paragraph 42 of Lumen Gentium. Indeed, in order that love as good seed may grow and bring forth fruit in the soul, each of the faithful must willingly hear the word of God and accept his will and must complete what God has begun by their own actions with the help of God's grace. Again, what I just said, but this is the, the, the text of the council laying it out. To live holiness, the perfect holiness we're called to, is to receive it first and then cooperate and willingly hear the word of God and accept his will and then complete what God began, what God has begun in us. Um, so there's there's a line in uh, I think it's the, the the first letter of John that you know we love the, we love God because He first loved us. This is the idea at work here. We have to complete what God began in us by giving us grace. The paragraph here 42 goes on to say these actions these these actions of bearing fruit in in the holiness that we're called to consist in the use of the sacraments and in a special way the Eucharist. Frequent participation in the sacred action of the liturgy, application of oneself to prayer, self-abnegation, lively fraternal service, and the constant exercise of all the virtues. So notice here when the council is calling people to this degree of perfection and holiness, it's, it's clear that we're receiving it and participating or cooperating, right? We're not just made holy, you know, sort of like waving a wand, but it's also not our mere human efforts that are going to give give us the holiness that we're supposed to um, achieve. Rather, we receive it, and then we cooperate with us. We have to frequent the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, and we need to participate in the sacred liturgy. And remember, if you've, if you've seen some of our previous episodes, the Council began by issuing a document on the liturgy. The liturgy is really what holds all of this together. For us to be able to participate and cooperate with the grace that God gives us in the sacraments, we have to continue to build our lives on the sacraments. But then we also have to apply ourselves to prayer, to self-abnegation, to take on suffering. We have to live in fraternal service of others and constantly exercise all the virtues. So this call to holiness is is not just sort of like a, a bland kind of um, you should be holy, you know, try and do better. It's not the church blaming the laity or blaming the the all the people in the world for not being holy enough. It's at the same time recognizing that, first of all, we're called to this holiness. We're given, through baptism, the grace that we need to cooperate with God. And in the other sacraments— we're given additional graces to help us enter more deeply into this holiness. And that by doing all of that, we offer an effective witness for others. So the liturgy and evangelization, which we saw in the liturgy document, are present here as well. In order to be a good evangelist, we have to be living a good, faithful life, rooted in the sacraments, participation in the liturgy, and that offers a witness for others. Um, and there's there's one other sort of little little like hint from the council here uh, at the end of the section, is at the very end of the section on the universal call to holiness at the end of chapter 5, paragraph 42, that I just really, it just really leaped out at me, and I want to just share it. So this is concluding this whole section on the universal call to holiness. Therefore, all the faithful of Christ are invited to strive for the holiness and perfection of their own proper state. Indeed, they have an obligation to so strive. Let all then have care that they guide aright their own deepest sentiments of soul. And I, and I like this idea of striving, of like really making an effort, um, and not just sort of whimsically hoping that we become holy, right? Um, and, and we see this in a lot of like our human endeavors, like, man, I just, I hope that I can 
you know, save money. I hope I can live within my means. I hope I can lose weight or whatever. But if you don't take concrete steps in that direction, if you're not really engaged in this striving, you know, you're, you're not likely to see any change. Um, there's a, a comedian, uh, Jim Gaffigan, has this great little bit about how nobody goes for saint anymore because you have to complete two miracles. You have to have two miracles approved and uh, that nobody even tries. And I, and I think that the Second Vatican Council here is, is calling us to sh- try. Like, we have to try it. Um, and, and it requires a real commitment. Just as much as God's giving us the grace we need, we've got to be actively engaged in that struggle. All right, so that's, you know, a little bit here about the universal call to holiness. The next two paragraphs, there's or chapters, rather, of the document, there's a chapter on religious, and that's uh, chapter 6, and then chapter 7 talks about the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. Um, so I want to give you some comments here on the role of religious. Uh, there's a really interesting focus in this document on nuns, sisters, monks, brothers, these these different forms of religious, uh, about what their role is and where they fit into the ecclesiology. The council's really clear that uh, a monk or, or a nun is not like some halfway point between being a layperson and being a priest, right? You can be a monk, right, and not be ordained. And if you're a nun, obviously you're not ordained. But it, so it's not that there's like ranks, like we got lay people, and then we have, you know, the ordained ministries of deacon, priest, and bishop, and then sort of in the middle here is the religious. Uh, rather, the, the council says there's actually people who are religious, who are religious, that are in the lay state, properly speaking, and others who are in the clerical state. In other words, ordained people, priests and deacons, bishops, who are also members of religious orders, or lay people who have taken these vows um, for particular purposes. So it's not a, a, like a, an intermediary halfway point between being a lay person and, and being a cleric, uh, but rather it's its own thing. Uh, and I think as Catholics, we don't tend to have as, as, good of, a, a, as deep of an appreciation as we ought to for the role of religious um, in the Church, um, but the Council lays out a few particularly important reasons why why the religious matter so much. One thing is religious give us this really critical witness to the presence of the kingdom of God and to the fact that the kingdom has already begun. There is tremendous evangelical witness in just seeing religious, seeing monks and nuns and brothers and sisters, right? Just the, the way they dress, uh, the way that, you know, some of the men, the practices that they take with their hair, shaving their head or having long beards or wearing the sandals or being barefoot. I mean, just to see a religious immediately has an impact it's still. And I think that's a really fascinating thing. When, when the council, you know, was taking place, there was probably a lot numerically a greater presence of religious, um, but people sort of took it for granted. Uh, maybe there wasn't as much of a, you know, sort of being awestruck by seeing a, a religious Today, I think that that witness might even be stronger than it was at the time of the council. Um, And it's precisely because the world needs the witness of religious that the council says we should not consider them to be people who have removed themselves from the world. So sometimes you'll meet people who will say that, oh, you know, a monk or a nun, like, they're not doing anything for the world. They've, They've taken themselves out, and they're just sort of letting the problems go by. Uh, they're not participating in in the world anymore. They've just sort of said, I'm, I'm out. You know, everything's crazy. I'm out of here. Uh, but th- there's something really interesting about that, um, about, about th- that the church sort of says in this document, that that's not really accurate. So this is, this is what the council says, the way that the, the text puts it. Uh, Let no one think that religious have become strangers to their fellow men or useless citizens of this earthly city by their consecration. For even though it sometimes happens that religious do not directly mingle with their contemporaries, yet in a more profound sense, these same religious are united with them in the heart of Christ and spiritually cooperate with them. So there's this real understanding that religious, even if they're, you know, in a Trappist monastery or a Carmelite monastery and they're they're cloistered, they are more deeply united to us and more deeply present to the world than maybe all of us who are caught up with 
the regular hustle and bustle of our daily lives and the, and the news cycle and all of the myriad of things that we have to concentrate on, right? This is what St. Paul says, that you know, if, you're, if you're devoted to Christ alone, your, your heart is undivided. Um, religious have this way of not necessarily needing to be in the midst of everything to still be deeply present to everything. Um, people talk that way about Mother Teresa, that if you met Mother Teresa, you know she had so many things going on, so many responsibilities, yet you felt like you were the only person in the world that mattered or even that existed when she spoke to you, when she looked at you. And this, I think, is really a, a really profound way of seeing religious. Um, there's also uh, this, again, this this idea that the religious show us the kingdom of God. So the paragraph 44 says, the profession of the evangelical councils, and again, that's poverty, chastity, and obedience, the, this profession appears as a sign which can and ought to attract all members of the church to an effective and prompt fulfillment of the duties of their Christian vocation. The people of God have no lasting city here below, but look forward to one that is to come. And nuns, monks, sisters, brothers kind of really make this clear for us that the world is not our final stop. We're going somewhere else. They've sort of put everything into what comes next. And by that, they're not stepping out of what happens now. Um, They're more present, uh, and they're united with us in the heart of Christ, and spiritually cooperate with us. All right, a little bit about religious, their role in uh, uh, this constitution on the church. Let's look at chapter 7 here, Um, just a few comments on the eschatological nature of the— this is a really long title of the chapter— the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. Essentially, what this part of the document is trying to explain is that The church is now beginning its mission, right? But that its ultimate destination is in heaven. And the council, sort of the document here, reflects this reality by talking about the Israelites and the Exodus, right? So the Israelites, after fleeing from slavery in Egypt, they're, they're still in the Exodus, but they haven't entered into the Promised Land. And that's sort of an image for the church now, like, we're out of we're we're out there and we're we're journeying toward God. We will not finally reach our destination until the end of times. Um, and so there's this sort of temporal dimension to the church. We are here now. We do have real struggles and problems. But that's not our final destiny. That's not, that's not finally where the church uh, will be located. The, 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 the true you know, destination for us is the, the new promised land, the new Jerusalem. Um, so there's this line here that the council says, However, until there shall be new heavens and a new earth in which justice dwells, the pilgrim church in her sacraments and institutions, which pertain to this present time, has the appearance of this world which is passing. And she herself dwells among creatures who groan and travail in pain until now and await the revelation of the sons of God. So that the church, in other words, is in its essence holy, right? But it's made of members who are not yet perfectly holy, right? And so there's this groaning and pain and suffering, but we're going somewhere. We're the pilgrim church that's ever more closely united to God in heaven. Um, And and another interesting dimension of this is the ecclesiology of the fact that the church, when we talk about the church, it does not just mean the people here on earth, right? But it refers to those in purgatory, to those in heaven, right? We are all united to the church in different ways. And this is why the document will again bring us back to the liturgy. The liturgy is so prominent in this document, especially in this in this section. The pilgrim church gathers, the council fathers say in paragraph 50, most clearly in the liturgy. Our union with the church in heaven is put into effect in its noblest manner, especially in the sacred liturgy. And then later in the paragraph, it says, celebrating the Eucharistic sacrifice, therefore, 
we are most closely united to the church in heaven in communion with and venerating the memory of, first of all, of the glorious ever Virgin Mary, of blessed Joseph and the blessed apostles and martyrs, and all of the saints. So that means that the communion of the church extends far beyond what we can see, right? And that, that it's temporally extending all the way back to, um, you know, the founding of the church, and it goes forward into the future. All of these things are happening all at once in the liturgy. So the liturgy, again, it's like the, the center of everything, which is what Sacrosanctum Concilium says that it is. Uh, but here, in, in specifically referring to the call to holiness and looking at um, the different functions of different members of the church, everything feeds into the liturgy. When we are participating at Mass frequently, when we are devoted to the Eucharist, it's going to be better for easier for us to be a witness. It's going to be easier for us to understand our calling to holiness and the particular gifts that we have, and so on and so forth, and our link to the Church and what the Church really is. So all of this is, is just really, really profound. Um, and, of course, there's much, much, much more that you could say about it. I'm going to close with just a couple of remarks here about the eighth chapter and then kind of put put this document sort of all, all together back again. The last chapter of Lumen Gentium, chapter 8, is about uh, Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And there were documents, or, or rather arguments early in the Council about a separate document all about Mary. Ultimately, the Council Fathers wound up agreeing that Mary's place is most clear when we look at the Church. In other words, Mary's not some separate thing to be studied, but she's sort of an exemplar of us for the Church. She shows us what the Church ought to look like because she's a member. She is a perfect disciple. She's the mother of God, yes, but she's also the first and perfect disciple. She is the leader in faith, charity. She is in perfect union with Christ. She was always there with him in the incarnation, at the birth, at the presentation, the wedding at Cana, at the cross. She maintained perfect fidelity. Um, so the, the the closing of the document focuses on Mary as an example of the church. Now, we've taken three episodes to look at Lumen Gentium, uh, and it's, it's, it's worth kind of sort of taking a step back and just thinking briefly about what is this entire document and what's it about. Essentially, this document is to give us a further, deeper view of, like, what is the church? What is it? What we see time and time again is the church, in the eyes of this document and of the council, continues the work and the ministry and the mission of Jesus Christ himself. Christ founded the church not just to be like a club for us to hang out in or a, a way for us to sort of separate ourselves from other people, but as a way for us to be united to him, to be united to one another in communion with him and uh, with one another, and to continue his ministry and his mission through evangelization, through lives of charity, through lives of prayer. Uh, and all of us have a unique role to play in that. Um the Second Vatican Council, again, did not invent the idea that lay people are called to particular holiness or have particular gifts, but this document, Lumen Gentium in particular, especially highlights the role of the laity. And so this is something that really is brought out clearly. The laity are going to go places where the clergy can't. They're going to be at the supermarket, at a sporting event, in businesses, in schools, and there we can be a light to others. We can participate in the mission of Christ by being witnesses, by being evangelists, both by the way that we live our lives, the act of charity that we practice, um, by our interior piety, by our own devotion to the sacraments, but also by the witness that we give, the teaching that we can provide, the clarity, the answers we can give to people who we're not going to ask those questions to anybody else. So there's a, a really an elevated sense of how important the laity are here that, again, surely exists prior to Vatican II, but is brought out with a really particular clarity in this document. Um, and it also, you know, highlights what a bishop ought to be, what a priest ought to be, what a deacon is, what are the roles of religious, how are they effective as evangelists, um, and what's the what's the value of, of living their lives? Um, why do they take these, these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience? So, 
This is uh, closing up the uh, one of the largest documents of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium. And uh, I hope you've been enjoyed these episodes. Please stick around. Uh, there's still more Vatican II to come. Thanks. God bless. <laughs>